D'accord. Bonsoir, bonsoir. Nous n'avons que quelques petites minutes de retard et justement. Good evening. We're only a little late, so uh, I would like to ask you to uh, take your seats, please. We are going to begin shortly. Good evening. 23 ceremony of Martin Enel Awards. Uh, bienvenue à vous ici et en ligne pour cette cérémonie 2020. Thank you for joining us online and uh, here. We are very happy to see you here with us and we also uh, uh, wish a warm greetings to uh, eminent personalities that are going to uh, be here this evening. Uh, President of uh, the uh, Council of State of Geneva. This is uh, President of uh, the City of Geneva, Mr. President of the uh, Grand Council of Geneva, President of the Administrative Council of Geneva, President of uh, the H UNHCR, representatives of the Consular Corps and Diplomatic Corps, and of course, uh, the family of the Martin Ennels Awards and the winners of these prize. Welcome to all. And I'm going to give the floor to a member of our foundation, Mr. Philippe Curat. The floor is yours. 
If you ever loved me, then avoid the sweet relief of death for a while and stay in this harsh world long enough to draw painful breath and tell my story. These are Hamlet's words to Horatio, who then famously had, the rest is silence. The world has probably not been this harsh for a long time. Europe is sinking into a war of aggression without example since September 1, 1939. Diplomacy seems to have disappeared. Five years ago, Ronan Farrow made the observation that diplomacy has declined after decades of political cowardice, short-sightedness, and outright malevolence in a book with the evocative title, War on Peace. Embassies today seem to be more like intelligence bridgeheads than spaces for dialogue and negotiation. The concert of nations, an expression coined in the 19th century and particularly used in the 1930s to designate international relations that are not based on the use of force, now seems to be nothing more than a cacophony of drum beats and cannon fire. There is an urgent need to return to more peaceful harmonies. Democracy and the rule of law are in retreat all over the world, which brings us back to the time when brown shirts and black uniforms were leading our societies into hatred and violence to the final catastrophe. In the last few days, we have learned that for several months, some 20 editorial offices of major newspapers have been investigating within the consortium Forbidden Stories the company specialized in the manipulation of public opinion and the dissemination of false information, as well as their impact on the elections that have been held in recent years in dozens of countries. Everywhere, invective replaces dialogue. Hate and insult try to adorn themselves with the attributes of freedom of expression, but they dangerously undermine its foundation blur the reference points, and trivialize violence. Security issues are replacing the climate emergency in people's priorities, diverting us from what remains, despite everything, the mother of all crises, the only one to which we should devote all our efforts, because if we don't solve it, everything else won't matter anymore. There is definitely something rotten in this world we live in. If you never loved humanity, then let's avoid the sweet relief of death for a while longer and stay in this harsh world long enough to take painful breath and tell the stories of our laureates. Kuram Parvez, currently in detention, is the founder and program coordinator of the Jammu and Kashmir State Civil Society Coalition in India and president of the Asian Federation Against Involuntary Disappearances, a collective of 13 non-governmental organizations from 10 Asian countries. Kuram Parvez has tirelessly investigated human rights abuses in Kashmir, despite repression and attacks by state and non-state actors, and has become an inspiration to young Kashmiris, as well as to Indian and international students whom he has encouraged to seek a peaceful resolution to the conflict. Let's take another breath to talk about Delphine Giraibe, a lawyer in Chad who is particularly known for her role in the trial of Isena Bre before the extraordinary African chambers where she pleaded for the victims. She describes her country as hostile to human rights defenders, but for more than 30 years and despite constant intimidation and threats. Delphine Giraibe has tirelessly cha challenged the authorities to guarantee the basic, rights, <clears throat> the basic rights of all people, including the rights to life, justice, freedom of opinion, food, education, and health. Let's take another breath to mention Feliciano Reina, who in 1995 founded an Acción Solidaria, an organization that promotes the rights to health equality and non-discrimination for Venezuelans with HIV and AIDS. 
Acción Solidaria began providing HIV, AIDS, drugs, and treatment, and raising awareness in a country where corruption and poverty were increasing dramatically and the health care system was in decline. What began as a single center in Caracas grew into a network of AIDS organizations throughout the country. In 2003, along with other human rights advocates, Feliciano Reina founded Corevida, the coalition of Venezuelan organizations for the right to health and life of people with chronic diseases. If you have never loved them, love them now because they dismissed the sweet relief of death for a moment, lighten our breath in a world they make less harsh by telling their stories. Let us listen to them. The rest is silent. We would uh, like to invite uh, the Vice President of the Executive Council of the City of Geneva, Mr. Alfonso Gomez. The floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, it is always an honor for me to uh, take the floor during these uh, ceremonies for the Martin Ennals Awards, especially today in 2023, particularly this year because this year has marked history as a dark year in terms of human rights because of the war in Ukraine, the regression of the rights of women in Afghanistan, the terrible repression that descends on protesters in Iran. The human rights have been attacked repeatedly and worldwide. It is in this environment, this worrying environment, that human rights defenders and defenders of fundamental rights have continued to commit with force and self-sacrifice in all times to denounce the abuse by governments, businesses, in order to protect the environment, to defend minorities, and to defend freedom and stand up against the traditional obstacles preventing women and members of the LGBTQIQ community to access and fully enjoy their rights. Although these commitments honor them, they put their lives at risk in over 80 countries worldwide and try to dissuade them of, from pursuing their activities as they are repeatedly attacked. This is the ruthless reality of thousands of defenders who are harassed, threatened, criminalized, imprisoned, and sometimes even killed for having defended a righteous cause, the, the universal rights. In most cases, the authors of these crimes are not prosecuted and often it is the states themselves that are orchestrators of this repression. The Martin Edels Awards calls us back to this reality and commends us to pay tribute to the courage, the exceptional courage of these men and women who fight for human dignity and the rights of their communities. Through the media that before their struggles, the prize tends to offer protection of these laureates, in particular in their countries of origin. As a host to international organizations, Geneva is active in this field and has a long tradition in terms of hospitality. The city of Geneva is profoundly attached to human rights, committed to them, and to promoting them. It is one of, the prior one of our priority actions, certainly at a local level and at an interna international level. In this framework and context, we organize this, we co-organize this ceremony and have been doing so for 15 years. Since the, its creation, this prize has honored extraordinary personalities that stand out because of their commitment, their self-sacrifice, and their courage. The three laureates for this edition are no different. Each one of them has stood out and fought for the respect of fundamental rights. 
In the name of the authorities of the city of Geneva, I would like to express my warmest greetings and congratulate very sincerely Mrs. Delphine Giraimé, Mr. Feliciano Reina, and Mr. Kouram Parvez for their respective struggles. For 30 years, their actions have allowed them to make human rights a reality for millions of thousands of people, and their convictions come across as a force and help us commit. I hope that this prize will help them move forward and defend the cause. Through them, again, this evening, I greet all activists and all those defenders of human rights who are tracked, threatened, arrested, and imprisoned worldwide. The occasion of this ceremony is to pay tribute to all these heroes in the shadow to whom I pay tribute. It is thanks to them and to their fights and for the respect of human rights, for the respect of our rights and the rights of every and each one of us. And this is how we are going to be able to move forward. And I thank them with my deepest gratitude. I also would like to thank uh, the members of the Martin Reynolds Award who year after year take on the difficult task of choosing the laureates among the numerous defenders of human rights. And I thank the foundation for this work that is done on an annual basis. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you for being here tonight because it is your presence that indeed reasserts your commitment to human rights, to human dignity, and to justice. It is thanks to you that the voice of human rights is strong this evening in Geneva and will be heard and will continue to be heard here in Geneva. Thank you. And heard beyond our borders. Thank you. And have a nice evening. Et nous allons rentrer dans le and now we are going to go to the heart of the topic. President of the International Federation for Human Rights. A very good evening to each and every one of you. It is my great privilege to join you this evening to introduce to you Kuram Parvez, the first laureate of this year's Martin Ennals Award. Kuram has played a frontline role for 20 years in the human rights movement in Kashmir, working and coordinating the Jammu Kashmir Coalition of Civil Society and the Association of Parents of Disappeared Persons. The latter became part of the FIDH network in 2019. Kuram is also the chairperson of the regional network, Asian Federation Against Involuntary Disappeared, these all show that his dedication to fighting for justice knows no borders. For too long, the serious and systematic human rights violations committed in Kashmir have been willfully ignored by the international community. These abuses have been relegated to an inevitable byproduct of the long-lasting tensions between India and Pakistan and their geopolitical implications. Yet, these human rights violations are rampant. And it is thanks to Kuram and his colleagues that we know about them. It is thanks to Kuram that we know of the more than 8,000 people who have been subjected to enforced disappearances. It is thanks to him that we know of the thousands of people who have been arrested and detained under repressive laws, subjected to torture and to other forms of inhumane and ill treatment. It is thanks to him that we know of the excessive use of force by security forces in response to protests and mass mobilizations of Kashmiri communities. For this work, Kuram has been repeatedly harassed and attacked by the authorities of India. His repeated and consistent advocacy is the main reason why, in September 2016, Kuram was stopped from traveling to Geneva to attend a UN Human Rights Council session. He was subsequently jailed for 76 days. 
Since November 2021, he has been arbitrarily detained under politically motivated charges, detained by the Indian authorities. Kuram's detention is an obvious attempt to stop him from documenting and denouncing human rights violations in Kashmir. Without him, these violations would go unreported amid the repression of local independent media and the Indian authorities' ongoing refusal to grant access to Kashmir to UN human rights monitoring mechanisms and other independent observers. Since Kuram's latest detention, information coming out of Kashmir has slowed to a trickle. Activists on the ground are scared to speak out, scared of facing the same reprisals. This is what the government of India wants. The fact that Kuram is not here with us today to receive his award in person is telling. It puts in the spotlight the decades-long campaign of the government of India to silence the Kashmiri civil society and to hide from international scrutiny the grave human rights violations which have been occurring in the region under a deep cover of impunity. However, the fact that we are here today to celebrate both Kuram's work and his dedication as a human rights defender proves that these attempts to silence him will not succeed. We stand here today to reaffirm our commitment to ensuring truth and justice for victims of human rights violations in Kashmir and to reiterate our steadfast support for Kuram. We also pledge to continue the fight to have him released from prison so that he can continue his work for the protection of human rights and human dignity. Here today, to accept the award on Kuram's behalf is Zaman Ashraf. Our hopes have been cauterized. Our imaginations infected. People have not forgotten what was promised to them in 1947 in Kashmir. It was in 1947 in August that India and Pakistan gained their independence and failed to reach an agreement on the sovereignty of Jammu and Kashmir, most of which remained with India. Kashmiris were never consulted. They were made invisible. In 1990, when I was just 13 years old, uh, my maternal grandfather was part of a protest demonstration against the molestation of women. So he was shot at. Around 50 people were killed and he was one of the persons killed. So it was primarily because of him that I got interested in why are people being killed at an age of 13. I became very angry. It was anger which was provoking me to do something. I was struggling with my own self. What is it that I would do would be the best revenge. Should I kill him? Should I spit at him? Should I shout at him? Should I hate him? Or what? Last tape recorded said, Bagas don't record Kirit, I'm said. Take a shot. 
I realized that I can do something which is more meaningful, where I would be involved in saving lives and not inciting violence and not becoming part of some revenge. Uh, and that's how I slowly uh, was encouraged to be a non-violent activist. There is, from last 70 years, a conflict going on between India and Pakistan uh, on a territory called Kashmir. India claims that it's an integral part, Pakistan claims that it's their part, and they're fighting over it. And people of Kashmir are also fighting for their liberation. And our neighbors are India, Pakistan, and China. All of them are armed with nuclear weapons. So that's the place where I'm working as a human rights defender. Garkot village, Paramula district, May 28, 2010. One grave, 16 bodies. Identify your village as three male, male youth. The body of three from not militants, of lone eight, who were residents of Nadia village, 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 July 27, from the evidence available, it involuntarily disappeared and murdered by members of the Indian Armed Forces. Doing the type of work that Kuram does day in and day out, um, talking to victims of human rights violation, investigating these violations, cases of torture, enforces appearances, mass graves, takes an enormous amount of resilience. All the military operations that have been conducted in the region with direct implication on civilians. It's not an exaggeration to say that without him and the work that the organizations that he's part of do, we wouldn't know half of what we know about the human rights violations that are happening in Indian and Minister Jammu and Kashmir. Combating terrorism is the official line. The Indian authorities have been able to operate um, with complete impunity under the guise of fighting terrorism. It's hard to get hard, solid data on the number of Indian troops in the region, but it's frequently referred to as the world's most militarized region. The visible aspect of militarization is the 700,000 troops, but there are so many invisible things about what militarization has meant in our lives. <laughs> Internalization of loss and horror is intended to produce fear and isolation. What we are trying to do now is to document our present. We are historians of the present. We are writing the history of our future generations so they know what we have gone through and why it is not possible for us to compromise and to surrender. Why is it important to remember? Because if the injustices here are forgotten, they will be repeated. The states are coming to what was hidden, what they were sophisticatedly hiding. We have unmasked them. In this effort, of course, we have lost a lot. Unfortunately, it's a truth around the world. People who are fighting monsters, with time, they become monstrous themselves. I'll realize that I would not let my anger channelize into hate. I feel successful because I did not become a monster while fighting the monsters.
Thank you, Zalman, to be here, to be the voice of Quorum tonight and to represent him. Uh, first of all, do you have any news about Quorum? Yes, thank you very much. I have a news from Kurum. He is currently in Rohini prison in Delhi, uh, one of the uh, most high security prisons in India. And you might be aware that uh, Kurum uh, had to amputate w one of his legs due to the landmine blast that he suffered uh, uh, in nearly two decades ago. So, person like him to stay in prison in, in hot and in cold, in very unbearable condition uh, like the Indian prisons are, uh, uh, hygienic and all other perspectives. So, it's un unthinkable that how his condition could be. Yet, he keeps up his spirit very high, and he has sent a message for the audience tonight. Uh, I'm going to read this sure. uh, quote. Needless to say, I'm extremely grateful for this honor. This award is an acknowledgement of the decades of unhard sufferings of Kashmiris. It is not that our voices are not reaching out, but Kashmiris are a deliberately unheard people. The international order does not want to hear us. So, with this recognition, the Martin Annals Award is actually going against this international tide that brackets Kashmir into silencing through Islamophobia. I am highly grateful, I unquote. Thank you very much for these words. Time magazine has also included Kurum in the list of the 100 most influential people in 2022. Uh, does this help, like this award tonight, to keep the light on what Kurum does? Of course. Every recognition for human rights advocates like Kurum Pavis and many others in India and wherever in the world the human rights defenders are working with dedication is highly significant. Does it protect it's him maybe as well? In, in the case of Kurum Pavis, the Indian government keeps disregarding whatever recognition has been coming and how People appreciate Kurum Pavis's work. Uh, we see their attitude. We see the way their institutions are behaving, uh, including the judiciary of India. So it's still the sign of respect for human rights and the human rights principles is not visible exclusively in the case of Kurum Pavis. But it helps the larger community the human rights defenders community, the people particularly for whom Kurum Pavis works, it inspires them. He himself is a very inspirational human rights activist, a very iconic uh, uh, advocate for human rights, uh, highly resilient. So now people know, the Kashmiris know that what Kurum Pavis has been doing for last nearly three decades has a very high value international organizations like the 10 juries, um, jury members of the uh, Martin Annals Award. Uh, these are very highly uh, insightful people, highly experienced people in today's world where we are dealing with human rights. So uh, all of their conscience have come together to decide that Kurum Pavis deserves this. And this is really helpful. We've heard his message of peace, of nonviolence, but he's been in prison now for 15 man months on charges involving terrorism. That word seemed to allow the government, the authorities, to do pretty much everything. And it's also a word that terrifies the people around him, the people 
who work for the same cause because it, it seems to be shutting everybody else's voice. That's what exactly the government of India wants to do. But I believe that the conscience of this world, the human rights uh, movement that is going on and that requires in, the, in this juncture uh, in the world that will ultimately defeat their, uh, the pattern of violence and the kind of abuse of draconian laws like UAPA, which empowers the agencies of the state in India to uh, accuse any individual person or entity, whomever they target, to be quote-unquote terrorist. And the judiciary of that country is supposed to accept that allegation as a prima facie truth. So that's what the law says. So in that context, basically, the state is denying the right to fair trial to persons like Khurram Pavis. There are many others uh, who are suffering similar charges. So this is extremely, uh, I mean, visible that how the authorities of India are abusing their power and abusing the draconian legislations that they have made to use against the minorities, to use against the dissidents, and particularly the human rights activists and journalists. Today, you don't see any report, any documentation from Kashmir. There have been increased deployment of security forces in recent months and recent weeks. Community centers are being occupied by the armed forces and different paramilitary forces in Jammu and Kashmir area, while people are forced to cancel their social ceremonies, like wedding ceremonies and other parties. And the state doesn't care. So in, in that context, journalists are being prevented, human rights defenders are being prevented to fly beyond the boundaries of India. They have created no-fly list for journalists and human rights defenders, and that includes the colleagues of Khurram. There are extreme form of surveillance that's going on. Uh, against the human rights defenders. Coercion is going on against them, and some of them are very much targeted to Kurram Pavis. So I want to request, I mean, we have the High Commissioner for Human Rights present here, that his office, the special procedure mandates of the human rights uh, mechanism of the United Nations, the treaty bodies, wherever India signs very few treaties uh, in relation to this kind of atrocities and crime against humanity that is happening in Jammu and Kashmir. So uh, every mandate should uh, step, up, step up their efforts at this point. And all the human rights organizations that are working uh, with their mandates in India and Jammu and Kashmir they must be more vocal, more active than ever. And we hope your message has been heard. And we are going now to uh, welcome Miguel Oral, uh, the chairman of the Geneva Bar Association. Good evening, uh, everyone. It is an honor for me to uh, say this speech before Delphine Giraibe. I give you the Martin Enold Award. I am particularly touched and moved this evening because uh, I saw the film that you are going to see in a few minutes. Mrs. Girabe, there are no words to honor you. Words are nothing to pay tribute to you. 
to describe your past actions and your present actions that have changed and continue to change the state of the world on a daily basis, no more, no less. A world that improves because thanks to your actions, the world becomes, it respects better human rights. The Jeune Afrique magazine described you in 2009 when you, design, when you were designated as one of the hundred most important people in terms of human rights worldwide as tireless. You are tireless, Mrs. Girabé. And thank God for that because the task of defending human rights in the world is huge. This task is huge and your dreams, your recurring dreams, show this. You close the door to an injustice and another door opens in the house, in this world where you feel threatened. You run to close another door and a new door opens onto another injustice. You run. In fact, you fight relentlessly, tirelessly against injustice. You reject fatality and you say, we can say no to what makes human beings suffer. I have never heard a more beautiful or correct definition of human rights. You embody human rights, Mrs. Jihabe, which is why I award you the Martin Ennolds Prize. Souvent, je rêve comme si j'étais dans une maison en danger. Je cours, je viens ici, je ferme une porte. Et quand je vais pour fermer la deuxième porte, l'autre porte s'ouvre et je vais dans tous les sens et puis après je me réveille. Je refuse la fatalité parce que Dieu ne nous a pas créés pour souffrir ni pour subir des atrocités. Je suis convaincu que tout ce qui fait souffrir l'être humain, on peut se lever et dire non. <rire> Comme petite fille, j'étais très timide. Hein? timide mais déterminée. Mon ambition après avoir euh, eu le bac, c'était d'aller étudier à l'extérieur du Tchad. C'était quand il y avait la guerre. J'ai fait ma licence en droit au Congo, au Brazzaville. Je me suis rendu compte que c'est vraiment la base d'une société. Et donc, c'est les règles qui vont permettre à ce qu'une société vive en, en harmonie. Et donc, quand j'avais fini ma licence, mon seul objectif, c'était de revenir dans mon pays. J'ai donc, je suis arrivée en 90, et l'ambiance était vraiment lourde. Tout le monde avait peur de tout le monde, en fait. Hissène Abré, le nom de Hissène Abré faisait trembler. Parce que si vous le prononcez mal, vous disparaissez. Et peut-être toute votre famille avec. Mais c'était huit ans de terreur où les gens sont arrêtés, torturés, 
illégalement, arbitrairement détenus dans des conditions exécrables. Les femmes ont été enlevées, déportées pour servir d'objets sexuels dans les camps militaires. C'est juste un cauchemar où les libertés sont inexistantes. Il faut qu'on fasse quelque chose pour que cette horreur ne se répète plus jamais au Tchad. Plus jamais ça. Plus jamais ça a été notre slogan. On a décidé donc de créer l'association tchadienne pour la promotion et la défense des droits de l'homme pour réfléchir et agir contre les violations des droits de l'homme, mais surtout enseigner à la population tchadienne ce que c'est que les droits de l'homme. Si aujourd'hui on parle des droits de l'homme au Tchad, c'est parce que ce travail-là a été fait en ce moment-là. C'était déjà en 1993 qu'est partie l'idée de porter euh, plainte contre Kissène euh, Abré. On était tout un collectif d'avocats de Dakar pour mener euh, ce processus-là aux côtés des victimes. Monsieur Hissène Abré a créé expressement des conditions de détention inhumaines parce que personne ne devait sortir vivant de ces jeunes. Et c'est en 2017 que la décision des chambres africaines en appel est tombée, condamnant Hissène Abré à perpétuité et euh, ordonnant l'indemnisation des victimes. C'était vraiment de l'euphorie parce que ça a duré euh, plus de 20 ans. La leçon, la plus grande leçon que j'en ai tirée, c'est vraiment la détermination, la foi en un processus. C'est une leçon que tous les gouvernants devraient tirer, donc ajuster leur, leur comportement. Mais de ce côté-là, même au Tchad, les gouvernants n'en ont pas tiré de leçon. Avec nous pour en débattre, avocate principale du PIL que le public intéresse là au centre, Maître Kemdelem Djirabé Delphine, bonjour. Merci, merci Nara. Il est vraiment intolérable que les pouvoirs publics tirent à balle euh, réelle sur des gens qui sortent pour s'exprimer. Les gens ont le droit de sortir, de manifester, de marcher, de s'exprimer pour pouvoir faire entendre leur voix. Depuis les événements du Jeudi Noir, on est très occupé à écouter les victimes, à les recenser en vue d'un procès. Le Tchad a été listé par Transparency International comme le pays le plus corrompu au monde. Et aujourd'hui, le système de gouvernement au Tchad, c'est la corruption. Mon plus grand espoir, c'est dans la jeunesse, c'est dans la femme, c'est dans la lutte. Nous ne sommes plus prêts à subir une dictature quelconque. Nous ne sommes plus prêts à subir de l'injustice à subir l'impunité, les inégalités. People will come and tell you I haven't eaten. À Delhi, à la ferme de Delhi. Inability to learn lessons from past project failures. On n'a pas encore gagné la guerre, mais on a gagné beaucoup de combats. Et le dossier Abré en fait partie. On a montré aux yeux du monde que l'impunité peut être vaincue. Et c'est encore l'exemple du procès Abri. Et aujourd'hui, on est debout pour dire que la démocratie est possible. 
est possible en Afrique, est possible au Tchad. Il suffit de le vouloir et de le réclamer. Alors je crois que je crois que je vais commencer I think I'm going to start by giving you the floor because I think that uh, you want to say a few things that are important to you. Thank you. I would like to uh, thank the Lord for being alive. Thank you to the Martin Enrens Foundation for uh, the honor that it gives me but that is a great recognition for all of the uh, Chadian defenders of human rights, Africans, defenders, and defenders worldwide. It is a recognition of the disastrous situation of human rights in Chad. And I would also like to thank my whole family that is here present with me in the room. My peers and those that have accompanied me here. I also would like to thank all those that fight at my side, Jacqueline, who is here with us. I would like uh, to also thank Ride de Brodino, our strategist, who uh, worked with us against Tissé Nabré on a daily basis, and uh, our, my colleague Colina, Corina Horta, who is also here, without whom I could never have had access to the international community. And I also would like to very much thank my brothers and sisters that are going through crises now, and all of these people that have supported me, my spiritual father, glory be to them and to the Lord. Thank you. Delphine, there's uh, one word that uh, comes again when we uh, talk about you. It's determination. And uh, of course, luckily you're determined because uh, as uh, the country that is one of the most corrupt in the world, you uh, are here to make a call in Geneva. Yes, I am a firm believer, and I believe that democracy can be a reality in Chad. And I'm convinced, and I'd like to say to the international community that this reality in Chad is possible. We just have to leave Chad, take its own responsibilities, manage itself, and manage its country. We don't want to be influenced from the outside. We are not interested in war the war between powers that take place at the deterrence of the citizens of Chad. We don't want to replace one dictator by another. We want our independence. We want to be in charge of ourselves. We have the resources, and we have the necessary potential. And that's all we ask for, to be left alone. We don't need France to support our system. We don't need Russia to take over from France either. And that's where my determination lies. What took place on the 20th of October last year is very important. Perhaps it wasn't uh, heard about enough. What took place on the 20th of October 2022 that we called Black Thursday was really a Black Thursday in the history of our country. We had never experienced that before. A government that comes out to uh, kill protesters with weapons and that kills hundreds of protesters. But the international community did not react. And it continues to support a government that can openly kill its population, kidnap its opponents, and make them disappear and that can, in full impunity, kill, because that's what it was. It was a planned killing. 
We wanted to silence all dissident voices. We wanted to make of Chad a country where there are no human beings but only slaves that we could manage. And the commu international community and the countries that represent human rights and the countries from whom we learn human rights cannot be in that position. It is uh, sons that uh, succeed in their father's position, and this is a system that has been in place for many years, and it is a record of violations of human rights that you know that we continue to denounce, but it seems useless. And as we move forward, all the declarations we make repeat that we want to go towards change and transition, transformation, but is this transformation for whom? For the international community, for France, for the Chadian people. And that's what we want to denounce. That's what we cry against. And we want you to voice the fight of our citizens. We want this to stop because it is not an honor. We are in Switzerland. This is a, pay that, a country that represents democracy where all voices can be heard, where we cannot kill people openly, kill human beings. In impunity. In Chad, that can happen. You can be killed, tortured, you can be kidnapped and forced into disappearance, and you will be silenced. And nothing will happen. Human rights are not respected. The defenders of human rights have to hide, some of them have to flee. And our life is like a life in prison because our lives are at risk and we are permanently threatened. So I'm crying out to you, I'm crying out for help as I am a laureate of the Martin Ennals Awards and this to defend the lives of the Chadian people. Thank you. And now we are going to welcome Mauro Poggia, the President of the State Council, who is going to announce the third laureate. Ladies and gentlemen, standard greetings having been said and done. Welcome to all of you in the name of the government and the Republic of the Canton of Geneva very simply but very warmly in your titles and functions and individual qualities. And of course, I need to say I'm here with great pleasure and emotion this evening. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights remains one of the legacies, the most important legacies of the last century. We will celebrate its uh, 70th anniversary this year. Its first article reminds us that all human beings are born free, equal, in dignity and rights. Its second article underlines that each and every one of us can enjoy all the rights proclaimed and freedoms set forth in the Declaration without distinction. And Article 25 stipulates that everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care and necessary social services. As we heard it this evening, the path is still long. In these moments of history, this fundamental text must not be neither forgotten nor ignored. Monsieur Feliciano Reina, in the mid 1990s, your partner Rafael died of AIDS. And when some would just simply say goodbye, some would simply go back to life despite the difficulties, you decided to commit. You decided to commit to provide medicine and treatment to your peers living with HIV and AIDS. You decided to in commit to defend the access to health to marginalized groups of citizens. 
and to commit to defend the rights of citizens, the right to their to life and to health. Geneva is, of course, will recognize itself in all these commitments since 150 years. It has asserted itself as a place of exchange and dialogue in favor of constructive processes the capital of international rights and human rights. Geneva is a place that you know well. You have come several times, especially in order to advocate for a follow-up UN mechanism that aims to document the violations of human rights in Venezuela. Geneva is also, and has been since 1995, the headquarters of the joint UN HIV AIDS program, known as UNAIDS. Geneva also rejoices itself in emphasizing the importance of civil society in the global governance mechanisms. And all these issues echo, and particularly echo, your commitment, your commitment that you commit to on a daily basis and that you pursue. Congratulations and congratulations from the international community. Fue una infancia y adolescencia muy sencilla, muy sabrosa también, ¿no? Éramos una familia grande. En algún momento yo conté, éramos 56 primos hermanos. Íbamos a casa de los abuelos a visitarlos y allí pasé muchísimos años, bueno, con mi prima hermana mayor, Yolanda Pantin. Para mí, Era estar como muy en contacto con la naturaleza, estar a caballo, eh, comer mangos eh, agarrados de la propia mata. Yo diría de mucha inocencia, ¿no? De no pensar que habría eventualmente una situación de, de una serie de problemas sociales tremendos, ¿no? Yo me fui de Venezuela en el año 76. La razón de la ida principal fue la sensación como de señalamiento, ¿no? Como hombre gay, esas acusaciones estaban por todos lados, ¿no? Cuando me voy a trabajar a Nueva York como arquitecto en el año 80, a mediados del 80, empieza un camino también insospechado porque había esta situación inmunológica afectando principalmente a hombres gays, pero en todo caso no tenía nombre, ¿no? Y ya habían muerto siete compañeros en la oficina de arquitectura en la que había trabajado. Eso fue un shock enorme, además eran todos compañeros que tendrían de eso, 22, 23 años, 24 años. Me vengo a fines del 81 para Venezuela. Empecé a hacer algunas amistades muy, muy cercanas y a Rafael lo conozco en el año 88. Es una persona que se sabía ganar el cariño de las personas. Tenía esta, esta como facilidad ¿no? de sonrisa y de relación con las personas. Lo quería muchísimo, lo queríamos. Y ya finalmente, sí, en el 94, a Rafa se le hace la prueba y ya tenía el VIH, el SIDA en realidad. Y significaba que la vida no podía seguir igual. Pues. Es, es, es un, fue un momento, después de esos años, una pérdida muy importante. ¿no? Yo tengo un poema dedicado a la muerte de Rafael. Este poema se llama Como un incendio de paredes altas. Esta escritura te resulta extraña, no así el poema que una vez leíste y que visiblemente te conmovió. El amigo de tu hermano va a morir pronto, pero anoche recordaste estos versos de Ritsos. Si la poesía no es consuelo, entonces 
no esperes misericordia en ninguna parte. Ya sabiendo que estamos en los últimos días, hablo con unos amigos y les digo, la vida no puede ser igual, hay que hacer algo ya. Y así nace Acción Solidaria, ese fue todo el primer periodo nuestro. Acción Solidaria nace en ese contexto de silencio, de estigmatización, de discriminación, de una lentitud para facilitar como un derecho el acceso al tratamiento antirretroviral que ya estaba comprobado para ese momento que se salvaba la vida en alianza con unas religiosas del Hospital Mercy de Miami. Nos abrieron unas puertas para hacer un canal que nos permitiera traer al país medicina antirretroviral con récipes de médicos de Venezuela. Y bueno, nos hace a nosotros entrar en el terreno de la acción humanitaria. Estamos en 30 hospitales públicos con insumos, que son unas 40.000 unidades al mes de distribución de insumos. Y estamos igualmente con nuestro programa de, del ámbito del VIH, con, digamos en 14 estados del país. Y seguimos documentando las situaciones de, de violación del derecho a la salud. La recomendación era el cierre. ¿Cuál era el, el análisis que se hacía? No se justifica tener una maternidad con todo lo que significa para que nazcan mis niños al año. Este es el área de terapia intensiva neonatal. Esta área, cuando nosotros empezamos, las lámparas de calor radiante no funcionaban. Todas las incubadoras estaban dañadas o con falta de mantenimiento. No teníamos insumos, no teníamos incubadoras para prematuros. Entonces, el proyecto fue, con Acción Solidaria, todo lo que era equipamiento de insumos. El primer año recibimos una tonelada de insumos, sí. donde se dotó la terapia intensiva prácticamente de todo. Venezuela es poco comprendida porque si uno no ve toda esta cantidad de matices que hay alrededor de por qué terminamos aquí, lo lógico sería decir, este es un país petrolero, las reservas más grandes del mundo, con enorme riqueza, que tú dirías, mira, esto no está en problemas. Ya según la plataforma de seguimiento a la situación migratoria del país, habla de 7 millones de personas que han migrado y además más de 700 mil personas dicen que se van a ir del país. Hemos tenido corrupción en el mundo hospitalario. Y también la negativa del gobierno a aceptar que aquí ha habido una situación muy grave. Más del 50% del personal de salud en salud pública se ha salido. Y en cuanto a personal de enfermería estamos hablando de más de 70%. O sea, ha sido una situación, de nuevo, de desestructurar todo el sistema sanitario. Y al final entendemos que no nos queda más remedio que meternos en la arena donde se, se da este conflicto político, ver con quiénes tener interlocución, cómo abogar porque se muevan recursos, porque se abran espacios de entendimiento, porque si no al final quien lo paga es la gente. ¿Qué me da esperanza? Es la idea de que tenemos todavía muchos espacios de oportunidad para actuar, para producir los cambios que el país necesita con la noción de largo plazo. Nosotros tenemos cantidad de puertas todavía y tenemos que poder ser capaces de generar las respuestas que nos hacen falta como país. Uno no puede dejarse vencer por las circunstancias. I think, I think we all want to, to thank Feliciana to having, for having shared so much 
of what makes your struggle today important and, and your fight. And I think it's quite a moving moment for you. Am I right? It, it certainly is, yes. Um, it, it, it's incredible how after so many years, you know, looking at some of these images, yes, I, I moved. I am moved. But also, I, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, leave this out, but I'm, I'm so honored to be with you, Delphine, and with you, Zaman, representing Quran, but also listening to your stories. It's, I moved. <laughs> it's a moment where emotions come up. What does it represent for you, this award? You told me that you've already had some news about what it means for you and for the people with whom you fight. Well, I, I guess two things that are, uh, to me, have been very important. One is that we tend to hear nowadays that the situation in Venezuela has improved, that there is really not uh, a, a real problem in the country. And we continue to say that we have a human rights crisis, as was described by Amnesty years back. It's still there. And I'm glad that the High Commissioner on leaving Venezuela referred to still arbitrary arrests, torture, and, and situations that must end in regards to, to, to not having an independent judiciary. I mean, all the changes that need to, to uh, take place in regards to the situation of human rights, sort of, let's say, classical perhaps. But the other thing is that we are still in a situation of a humanitarian emergency. According to our studies on the ground, some 18 million people still need uh, humanitarian aid. This is 67% of our population. And no wonder why 7 million have left. It's just so unbearable, so difficult, you know, when you do not have electricity, access to water, all the issues of health, that at the end you feel like you have to find your, your life somewhere else and not in Venezuela. This is, again, 25% of our population living since 2017. So when we speak about human rights, it's true that sometimes the right to health, to care, doesn't seem maybe to come right at the top, but you have to be cared for, you have to be alive to be able to fight every day. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I mean, this is something that uh, to us has been also a call for having social, economic, and environmental rights on the agenda to really make sure that even though our government is hiding numbers, is not even letting the UN system use the, 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 the numbers of people affected in, for example, the humanitarian response plan, uh, it, it is to us extremely important to make this visible and to use, for example, our platform, which is we have to create our own possibilities of getting information out, given, again, the fact that we do not have official information. And, and with this also, Catherine, I'd love to uh, also say that another meaning for us of the, of the award is that, uh, you know, when it was announced, I started receiving messages from colleagues saying, I feel represented in the award because we've worked as a, as a coalition for such a long while, as Acción Solidaria implementing our humanitarian action program. We have 140 partners on the ground to be able to work in public hospitals and to care uh, in our latest uh, counting for over 720,000 people with treatments for all sorts of health conditions. This is not HIV specifically. And then in, uh, this is through Acción Solidaria, and then through the issues of civil society, the civic space, freedom of association, uh, and the right to defend rights through another organization that I'm a very uh, proud of, a part of, Civilis Human Rights. We're working with, you know, some 700 uh, organizations also on the ground. So it is collective action, and, and to me, the award signifies that. It's a recognition of the value of acting together uh, to have more impact, to reach more people, and you know, to hopefully produce the changes that we're looking for. 
We just have a few minutes to talk all together because it is, I, I think for you, it's been very productive as well to be able to talk to all together. And there's something that you've been saying, both of you, Delphine and you, Feliciano, about the hope that you have in, in the young generation to carry on what you're doing. Oui, uh, merci. Indeed, thank you. Hope is allowed because what happened on the 20th of October in Chad is the work of youth, youth that rejects inequality, injustice. And it is that youth that stood up to express itself. And it is uh, that youth that we count on. It was also women, women who let go of their fear, who came out, and uh, even though they came out naked in order to protest against the situation where their children were ill-treated, discriminated against, we shot them as well. So hope is allowed because we have reached the most intolerable and when we get to that, things have to come to a halt. And that's where my hope, my determination pursues. And I want to continue to voice that of the Chadian citizens. Thank you very much. The hope is, first of all, the world will listen and look at the ground what is happening in a territory where around 9 million native population having uh, approximately 700,000 to 1 million armed forces of, of uh, and security forces uh, deployed in Jammu and Kashmir. So in that context, all the, the repressive legislations are in place. Media is silenced. Uh, civil society groups were forced to shut down. Uh, dissident human rights groups, all based in Kashmir, are forced to shut down. And in that context, the responsibility remains to the rest of the world beyond geopolitics, beyond financial interest of the big market uh, of India, we need to be, I mean, non-selective when we talk about, when we think about human rights. And the people of Jammu and Kashmir and the people who are working for this documenting human rights violation in such a terrible a challenging condition, they must not be ignored. And we, if today we fail to do our job, it, would, it won't be not only self-defeating, but tomorrow we will have to face some bigger problem that we are not imagining at the moment. So I hope that everybody takes uh, this call and then responds to with very effective, sincere actions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all this message of hope. Uh, now we're going to have a little bit of music. So if you're all ready for that. So we're going to be, be welcoming a group that comes not very far from your country. It's actually a place that's uh, a plane that I've been, I've never been to Venezuela or to Colombia, which is the next country. So, ce soir, nous avons un peu de musique donc, qui nous vient de loin, mais par des musiciens qui sont... This evening we'll have uh, music that comes from afar. Uh, and we are going to listen to traditional music from uh, the Colombo-Venezuelan plane by a group called Convergencia Janera. Forgive my pronunciation, and I'm going to uh, present them to you in more detail. It is Monica Prada, who is going to come and play uh, a guitar with four strings, Jaime Vargas, uh, who is going to play the harp, 
and Erdano Imbanez, who is going to play the maracas. And they're going to play uh, two pieces for us. Polo Magardeño, a popular music from uh, Margarita Island and Casabelia, the beautiful house. Welcome to them.
gente que lo hace florecer Si eres el lirio, ahí dame tu perfume Ahí si eres la fuente, dame de beber Si eres el lirio, ahí dame tu perfume Y si eres la fuente, ahí dame de beber Vino de España y a Venezuela llegó El polo vino de España El polo vino de España Y a Venezuela llegó Y al ver mi isla tan bella Y al ver mi isla tan bella Ahí en ella se quedó Y sus ojos de candela No deje China que se acerquen los ladrones Donde podamos bailar este joropito Como se baila en llanos castanareños Apunta el soga poco a poco y trancaíto Oyendo el arpa del maestro Figueredo Quiero comprar para ti una casa bella Que tenga nardos y claveles al entrar donde se coja con las manos las estrellas, donde se duerma con el ruido de la mar. Dos y claveles al entrar Donde se coja con las manos las estrellas Donde se duerma con el ruido de la mar Quiero comprar para ti una casa bella Que tenga rosas y claveles al entrar Donde se coja con las manos las estrellas Donde se duerma con el ruido de la mar Donde el celaje de un perrito centinela Pase la noche de la puerta a la sus ladridos y sus ojos de candela No deje China que se acerquen los ladrones 
donde podamos bailar este joropito, como se baila en los llanos apureños. Apunta soga poco a poco y trancaíto, oyendo el arpa del maestro Figueredo. Quiero comprar para ti una casa bella, que tenga rosas y claveles al entrar, donde se coja con las manos las estrellas, donde se duerma con el ruido de la mano. Gracias, merci beaucoup. Dear laureates, dear friends, introducing the next speaker is normally not the most exciting assignment, but this time it is different. That the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights comes in person to an award ceremony for human rights defenders is extremely meaningful. I am proud that every High Commissioner from Mary Robinson onwards has accepted this invitation, sometimes even in the face of strong repercussions as with High Commissioner Zeit in 2016. When I went to ask the late Sergio Vieira de Mello, our former colleague at UNHCR, to come in. Donc, pour ce, cet ancien collègue. I added, I don't do it for you, Hans, but for the MEA, because through the jury, it represents the whole of the human rights movement. And I think he was right. The simple picture taken of the laureates together with the High Commissioner at the end of the session is considered by many human rights defenders an important tool of protection. I've had the pleasure of working with Volker Turk at the High Commissioner for Refugees for many years, a long time ago. He always expressed his conviction that refugee work is part of the broader human rights movement. And I know that he came himself to several earlier MEO ceremonies. Now many of you know that I have been living in Greece for over 20 years and have been solidly Greekified. Therefore, I'm most pleased to add to the peaceful coexistence movement by inviting this special Turk to take the floor. Protocol observé. Very moving to be here at this Martin Annals, Annals, Annals Award Ceremony for Human Rights Defenders, and I have to say I'm very touched to be invited. It's a great honor to be here, and we are really doing it for all human rights defenders around the world, and I think you represent them in in a most exemplary way, and I really have to say this. We also know that the strength of the human rights movement lies with the ones who fight for the rights. I mean, there's absolutely, we would not, the human rights movement wouldn't exist without people like yourselves, and without all the ones that are doing it on a daily basis, and the ones that have done it in the past. And let's not forget, the human rights movement has really come out of a struggle for the fight for freedom. Um, nourished by so many different social movements, feminism, decolonization, the anti-apartheid movement, let's not forget that either, the LGBTI movement, the various movements that we have seen over the last couple of years, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, uh, the climate action and the environmental movement, so all of this has really nourished what actually makes human rights today a reality and something to reckon with. The awards that were given today really pay tribute to the tireless work of human rights defenders, to their service to humanity, but also their resolve 
to ensure dignity and fundamental freedoms for all and to tell stories because you all tell stories and the stories of the three laureates today Huram Parves, Maître Delphine Chabré and Feliciano Reina your stories exemplify the essence of what defense for human rights means in today's world. And we know that amidst the most difficult circumstances, your work has given a voice to the voiceless in their strife for their rights to liberty and due process to health and access to information or to truth and justice and the most fundamental right to life while they have contributed to improving the lives of thousands of people. Thank you for your resolve, for your energy, for your determination and your vision. As you all know, and this was mentioned before, 2023, this year is really important. It's the 75th anniversary year of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And if you go back to that time, when it was actually drafted in the wake of the horrors of the Second World War. And let's also not forget the struggle for decolonization, because sometimes there is this myth that the Universal Declaration is a Western product. Well, no, it was actually also emerging from the decolonization process, and it was emerging. And I was just in Haiti last week, and you, if you go into the history of Haiti, you actually see a country that emerged out of the struggle for freedoms and human rights because, as you know, Haiti was the first republic founded 219 years ago because of the fight against slavery, anti-racism and colonization. And I think we sometimes forget the struggles that have gone before us and what it actually led to in so many ways. So that document that was drafted 75 years ago set out a vision for a better world, set out a vision that put human dignity at its core and that really energized the world in unity and also with this never again attitude. And I think it is so important when we are faced with so many geopolitical tensions around the world and with the very commonplace arguments that are used when it comes to the defense of human rights to actually go back to that text and to remind especially leadership in all countries around the world what this text actually means. It is about the celebration of justice and equality for everyone. There's another document which perhaps doesn't attract the attention that it really deserves. It's, we also mark this year, the 25th year of the UN Declaration on Human Rights Defenders. And it has really helped to ensure the recognition of the courageous efforts of human rights defenders. And it is those people, it's you that bring the vision of the Universal Declaration to life. Regrettably, and we have heard it today, we cannot talk about the work of human rights defenders without being mindful of the ever-present dangers that they face. And the President was just mentioning me, to me that all the awardees of the laureates of the past have one thing in common, having been in prison, and we see it uh, with, with, uh, with Humar today, which is really extremely troubling. And, I, and you mentioned, Hans, my work with UNHCR, and indeed I, I met, I mean, thousands of refugees in my life, and they had to flee, they had to leave their country because of what they would have faced because of their defense for human rights. And all too often we know that the only way for human rights defenders to actually save their lives is actually to flee and be recognized as refugees. We know that all too often human rights defenders continue to be intimidated, attacked, imprisoned, killed, and it is insufficient to simply say that these attacks on freedom must stop. We need transformative action. And we need to use this anniversary year very much from that point of view. We know that the powerful voices of human rights defenders are advancing societies everywhere in the world to be fairer, to be more equal, and to be freer. We know that human rights defenders, and I include in human rights defenders also all the ones who work on the environment on the, and, the, and on the climate, and you will have seen that those who 
sometimes now fight for climate action, even in the global north, are challenged even through arrests and a penalization of it, which is very worrying. And they really help us tread the path towards a brighter future. And I just want to mention on climate action because we would not even be where we are today had it not been for the young, well, actually I would say girls and boys and then young people who started the, the demo, when they started demonstrating on a Friday. And we are really owing to them that the climate action and, and the, the climate fight is, is so much at the center of it. We know that we cannot and we need to bear in mind and that's so important that we have a collective responsibility to protect human rights defenders, to listen to them, to celebrate their commitment as you do in this award ceremony to this year and in, in the years to come, and also to make sure that their contributions to human dignity and human rights are, and, and, are, are recognized. I'm determined to take determinative action on this front. You probably saw uh, as part of the initiative on human rights and the Universal Declaration, I have asked all governments to review those who are arbitrarily detained currently. And we are going to follow up individually with a number of governments in order to get people out of prison where they shouldn't be in the first place. And we are going to take stock of where we are at the end of the year because there are too many cases of human rights defenders and of others who are ending up in prison in, not in line with international human rights law and because they defend themselves human rights. It's also important that we push together for much stronger commitments to the two landmark documents that I mentioned, both the Universal Declaration of Human Rights but also the UN Declaration for Human Rights, of, for, for, for human rights Defenders. We will do whatever we can to bring the voice of human rights defenders to the fore. And I think, Feliciano, you remember I, when I was in Venezuela, before I even met the government, it was extremely important for me first to meet victims, human rights defenders and NGOs. And I've made this standard practice in all visits to countries that I do because it's so important to actually hear first from them before we have any discussion with governments. So I congratulate the three of you for bringing hope. You mentioned your hopes in, in, in what you want to achieve, for effecting change, and for inspiring new generations of human rights defenders. I think you are an incredible inspiration to many, many people around the world. Your determination to speak truth to power, to protect others, it will help and inspire also young people to do the same and to really fight for openness and freedoms in our societies. It will demonstrate that human rights actually has no borders. They can never be stopped and they must never be silenced. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to uh, the end of our ceremony and I am very sorry I'm going to have to hold you back a few moments before we can enjoy the beautiful cocktail offered to us by the City of Geneva. I have a short list of thanks and gratitude. If you can find a place here on the stage and also the laureates, please. Um, thank you, High Commissioner, for staying with us. So uh, a couple of uh, thanks. Um, we could not all be here together without the help and support of so many people. I think um, first and foremost, of course, our co-host, the City of Geneva. Um, I'd like to thank our donors as well who make it possible for human rights defenders to come to Geneva and be honored in this way. I'd like to thank as well many diplomats and colleagues from International Geneva that are here supporting us, uh, the wonderful uh, audiovisual teams in the back, 
our small staff who have had tremendous patience, um, especially with me this week. <laughs> and um, three people in particular, Anne-Cécile and Nicolas from the company Trivial Mass, who've made this event run so smoothly. And of course, our wonderful moderator, Catherine Sommer. Um, there's one more act of gratitude um, that we'd like to conduct this evening. It's coming about 10 years late, but I think um, we have the opportunity tonight to correct an unjust situation. The universe has conspired so that we can together correct an unjust situation. Um, it just so happens that in 2012, the Martin Ennals Award honored uh, the Bahrain Center for Human Rights which um, had been promoting freedom and democracy and documenting violations of human rights in the hopes that someday there would be justice in the Gulf. And at the time, one of its leaders, uh, unfortunately, just before the ceremony, was jailed. And then he spent the next 10 years in and out of detention. But um, eventually he was released, and he's here with us tonight. <laughs> Nabil, surprise. <laughs> I'm sorry to do this to you. Nabil did not hear at the time. <laughs> so Nabil did not hear the applause at the time, and now you've heard it. Um, we wanted to make sure that you would hear it. The fact that you're here tonight is so meaningful on many, many levels. I think it gives us all hope that we'll someday be here with Kuram as well, and he will hear our applause, and with Sultan, and with Nasrin, and with Abdul Hadi, and with so many Martin Ennals Award laureates that are not with us tonight, and other prisoners of conscience all around the world. So thank you, Nabil. Off script, <laughs> our master of ceremony to oui. conclude the proceedings. Alors je sais, voilà, voilà, j'attendais juste que ça fonctionne. Super. Uh, merci beaucoup à tous. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you for being here. We are going to take a few pictures with our laureates. I'm going to hide and uh, please, uh, our meeting, annual meeting, will take place again next year. And I think we will celebrate. Uh, 30 years as well. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much. See you next year. All online as well to have there with us and to our laureates. Un grand merci.